All right, guys and gals, here we go for lab 21. Lab number 21. Man, I cannot believe we are at 21 of these suckers. Uh, but we're just going to keep going. We're going to keep doing it until we run out of things to say. So uh, today's topic is a continuation of our last lab, lab 20, uh, which was on audio gain structure in wireless systems. Uh, I felt like I could handle that one pretty well and, and get through that with some level of proficiency. However, today's topic, uh, we're going to cover transmission and reception, trying to get some best practices for transmission and reception and keep that all going and have a successful event. And I'll just flat out admit that is my weakest discipline. I do not know all that much about that. I just have not worked with all that much wireless. And usually I leave that up to more people, people with more expertise than I have, which brings us to today's webinar or today's lab. So um, I have invited in uh, some specialists here today. And, and you know, really, if I was going to be doing a big event, uh, etc., that's what I would do. I would just go call these guys anyway and say, hey, what do I do here? It's not working right. Can you help me I'll fix it and blah, blah, blah. So uh, I've got quite a, uh, an esteemed uh, few guys here today that are going to take us through this. And we're going to talk about some topics and make this as interactive as you want. Bring your questions uh, and we can, uh, I'm sure, hopefully we'll be able to answer anything that's going your way. So let's take a look here today. All right. So here's the guys that are going to be driving this day. I'm going to be driving. They're going to be kind of handling all the uh, the topic matter and talking with the expertise here. So I'll introduce the. I'm going to introduce these guys and give you a little bit of their background if that's all right. So on the left we have uh, Carl Winkler. I have known Carl for many many years. Uh, we've been we've become pretty good friends over the years. And Carl is the vice president of sales and marketing for Electrosonics. Uh, he also has served, uh, you know, as a system designer and a site coordinator on uh, literally hundreds of theater, TV shows, and feature films. Uh, he works on this stuff all the time. Uh, he's also written dozens of articles on the topic and is an instructor for Synod Khan's uh, Making Wireless Work, uh, those end user trainings, which is right up our alley here. That's really what we want to be uh, focused on here today. We're going to try to make this very pragmatic, very practical and give you some really good tips on how to get your wireless systems uh, working uh, dependably. The next person you see on the screen there is my dear friend, Joe Chaudelli. Joe and I have known each other longer than I've known Carl, which is saying something. Uh, so me and Joe go back a long, long way. And uh, Joe is going to bring some fantastic expertise uh, to this thing today. And, and we're going to talk about a lot of stuff with him. He is currently the, the director of Spectrum and Innovation at Sennheiser. Man, I wish I had a title like that. I mean, that's pretty good. Uh, he's also a, a, uh, an advisor in the private sector to the International Telecommunications Union in Geneva. See, it just keeps getting better every time I talk about this guy. And uh, if that's not enough, he owns his own company called uh, Ravel uh, that specializes in holographic technology. And they hold three patents on that technology uh, going forward here. So, you know, Joe's, Joe's brings a, a wealth of knowledge and experience here. It's going to be great for this conversation today. And then finally, or then uh, my next person is the well-dressed man there in the pictures. Uh, that is Volker Schmidt. Volker was kind enough uh, or is kind enough to join us from Germany today. So, and I know it's very close to beer 30 over there. So uh, we're going to try to make Volker's time. Yeah, it is beer 30. I knew it was beer 30 somewhere. <laughs> So uh, Volker has quite a storied past here. I mean, he is, has really, really impacted our industry in a really positive way. You know, he has uh, he spearheaded the creation of Sennheiser's most successful and really most innovative wireless product lines with the Evolution series, uh, the MKH, the MKE, uh, the 3000, 5000 wireless systems. So, you know, deep, deep domain experience and knowledge here uh, from Volker. Uh, he's held the position of Senior Engineer for Wireless Technology at Sennheiser and is currently, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Volker, the Director of Customer Development and Application Engineering, uh, which works really closely with uh, Solutions Training and Sennheiser Sound Academy, you know, which all focuses on uh, support and training for customers and, uh, and end users around the planet. I mean, he's, he's, he's global, folks. And then uh, finally here we have Jason Waffle. Now, this is my first interaction with Jason. He came highly recommended from 
uh, a professional that I work with here in town named Fred Demonagoni. I said it right. How about that? Uh, and <laughs> who does lots and lots of TV work. Uh, but he, he highly recommended Jason for this. And I'm glad to have sure somebody uh, from sure here as well. Uh, Jason has a really, really great resume of experience here. He's, he spent about 10 years as an RF coordinator and distributed antenna systems designer uh, on some of the, really some of the biggest television events you're ever going to see. You know, things like the Grammys, the, the ACMAs, the billboards, you know, Showtime boxing, even the Super Bowl. So, you know, he, again, this is somebody who's, who knows what they're talking about. And I am really, really glad to have him here. Uh, he just, he rec I guess I could say recently joined Sure in an official capacity as a senior specialist and a market development manager for Pro Audio. So, guys, if you got questions that can't get answered here today, I, you know, I don't know where I'm going to send you. So, uh, let's try to get this thing going here. As, you know, if I'm not careful, we could be here for four or five hours talking about this stuff. So, but we're going to try to narrow it down today uh, to try to get some best practices going on some of this stuff. Uh, and try to demystify this thing called wireless, you know, because, you know, I would just tell you, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything more capable of sending a show or an event into complete pandemonium than when the, the wireless systems are not working correctly, whether it's ear monitors, microphones, whatever it is. When that part's not working right, the whole thing just seems to kind of come down to a crashing halt, so... You know, I also want to give you one other little disclaimer here. You know, I, I've been, I obviously have three companies represented here. This is not meant to create any kind of, uh, you know, competition or, you know, be any kind of comparison to these companies or their products. I, this is really just a collection of experts with knowledge, and I want them all to share uh, with, the, with the end users here uh, that are in this, uh, in this lab today and try to glean as much knowledge as we can here. Okay, so we're going to narrow it down. We're going to talk about four specific topics today. Uh, the first of which is going to be frequency coordination, right? Meaning I've got to know what is out there in the airways where I'm going to place my wireless system to give myself the best chance uh, to operate. And this is getting harder and harder to do, given the squeeze that is being put on the enter entertainment industry in terms of bandwidth and spectrum, right? So. Uh, also, I'll just, uh, before I get too far, I want to state in the background, you guys are welcome once we get started here to ask questions in the chat. Uh, Carl, Volker, Joe, Jason are all going to be kind of watching when they're not presenting, and we'll try to answer questions in the background there as well. I will save that chat and post it in the lab uh, folder on the G Drive, okay? So uh, you will be able to go back and reference it uh, along with the video replay if you want to do it. But frequency coordination is going to be one of the topics we talk about. Uh, we're also going to talk about re uh, receiver and antenna placement, uh, things to look out for, best practices for that. How do I set myself up for success, especially in these really, really high tech events where there's more RF flying around these things than you can ever imagine. Same sort of thing for transmitter do's and don'ts. Uh, there are some best practices for where to place a transmitter, how to place it on a body. I mean, let's face it, you have, might have some artists that have four transmitters sitting on them at times, you know, so uh, how, do we, how do we set that up for success with our artists? Martin, if you could please you, mute your mic. Actually, I'll do it for you there, buddy. Sorry, no sweat. And then finally, uh, we're going to have, uh, we're going to talk about RF gain structure. Now, if you've been a, uh, you know, a follower of the lab, et cetera, you know gain structure is something that we talk about all the time. Uh, and in wireless system, there is such a thing as RF gain structure. How strong is the signal? How, do, how well does it get distributed? Uh, how well is it being handled by send and receiving devices? All right, so we're going to talk about that. And we're going to try to keep it kind of to those four topics. And I'm going to kind of treat it as a round robin here. I'm going to let a different person start each one of these um, discussions. But I'm going to let them all contribute before we move on. All right, so... Uh, they have some presentation materials that they might want to share uh, going forward. We'll just let them share their screen up and get it going. All right. So how does that sound, everybody? Everybody feel like we're going to do some good here? Everybody all right? Okay. Yeah. A lot of thumbs up there. Great. All right. So uh, with that said, I'm going to jump out of screen sharing here. And we'll get to the discussion here. All right. 
Uh, so the first uh, topic we want to talk about here is uh, frequency coordination. And I'm going to uh, ask Joe Cialdelli uh, to kind of lead us off here uh, to talk about this. Because, you know, th this is, as some of you may or may not know, you know, Joe is leading a, a pretty good crusade, uh, you know, kind of lobbying the FCC to kind of limit or halt the... Um, the absorption of all the bandwidth, all the spectral bandwidth for cell phone companies, et cetera. You know, he's, uh, we're doing this with the FCC, uh, et cetera. So, you know, maybe Joe, you know, let's, let's kind of just start here. And I think I'm, I'm going to ask you a favor here. I, I, you know, I know we just passed a, the first deadline for submitting a request to the FCC, you know, to reserve bandwidth for the, uh, for the entertainment industry. You want to take us, just give us two minutes on that. Uh, I actually, I see that you've posted the, the UHF channel support doc. Why don't you just run us through how to use that document? I'm going to respectfully ask that everybody who's here, if you're here on concerned about wireless, you need to do this process, which is fill out this form and submit it for consideration by the FCC. So Joe, take it away and, and walk us through uh, what to do with this document. And then we'll get on the fundamentals of frequency coordination. Thank you, Robert. And when it all boils down, five minutes will make a big difference. You can use the easy to use template that I posted in the chat. And basically, it, it's pre addressed. And all you really need to do is state who you are, that you support this initiative, and anything else you want to say. And then you can either file it directly with the FCC, or if you don't want to go through that learning curve of where to navigate through their website, you can simply just email it to me with a quick note, please file uh, with the FCC on my behalf, and we'll be happy to do so. We received dozens and dozens of, of um, letters that we filed for the comment period that just ended on Friday. But the reply comment period is just as important and that ends April 19th. So you got, uh, got about uh, uh, two more weeks. Um, but please, uh, the more support we get, it, it'll make a big difference. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I would concur there. You know, just if you, uh, if you don't really grasp what's going on, you know, the, the cell phone companies, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Joe, are consuming all of the available airspace for transmission and reception, leaving us very, very small windows. So this whole concept and this discussion of frequency coordination, which means allocation for your systems that you're going to use on a day, becomes even tougher because you, you, you may end up with way fewer choices now when you're actually on site on the job. Is that correct, Joe? Is that the right way to look at it? That's absolutely correct. But I will add that, you know, not all frequency bands are the same. It's because different frequency bands have different propagation characteristics. And uh, basically, frequencies, frequencies between 150 megahertz and 2,000 megahertz, or 2 gigahertz. Basically, that's the sweet spot for wireless microphones. So we have typically and classically operated in vacant, uh, locally vacant TV channels within the UHF range. So. Uh, basically, the FCC has been considering designating a TV channel just for wireless microphone use and shared with white space devices. I won't go into that detail right now. But this would be an important safe haven for your most critical wireless microphone links because this is the frequency range where wireless microphone applications uh, are are best suited thank you right okay well you know let's uh let's move on to this then and talk about how to do this on a day-to-day -day basis like when we're setting up you know you know how do we go about picking frequencies that we're going to use I, obviously or maybe not so obviously you know one of the things we want to do on a given site is go search for interference right and look for open areas that we can actually use. So uh, 
I, you know, I'll, I'll just throw it up. Who wants to go next? Let's talk about some practical ways of doing this. I know a lot of, a lot of the receivers now have scanning capabilities, the ability to look for open space. Let's talk about some practical ways to ensure that you're using something with, uh, in, a, in a free zone at your event. Anybody want to take that on? Don't be shy. I'll call your name if you don't answer. So. <laughs> I can jump in, Robert, if you like. Yeah, that's fine, um, Carl. Go ahead. I, I think the first step is understanding the local landscape, like what you're saying, and that, and to talk about, you know, to dovetail what Joe mentioned, you know, RF landscape in the in the prime upper VHF and UHF range has become quite crowded. Um, I'll show a scan here. This is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, which shouldn't be that crowded and is normally considered a decent place to do work. We're a city of half a million, uh, but nevertheless, it's. Uh, you know, it's fairly crowded here. Everyone see that? There we go, yeah, got it. And so, you know, the little arrow there is pointing to uh, an RF carrier and uh, the rest of it is mostly DTV. And you can see each one of these sort of bumps is about six megahertz wide. And there, there's a couple gaps between 470 and, uh, you know, 615 or so. The gap at the top here is the uh, uh, TV37, which is off limits to wireless mics and, and DTV. So this would be a, a feasible place to put some channels of wireless, but it gives you an idea that even in a small town, uh, there's a lot of crowding. Uh, but so the first step is to understand what's in your local environment. And there's some databases online and I'll look for a link and post it in the chat uh, that's got uh, uploads from people who have done scans with various devices and wireless receiver systems. So this scan was done with receivers. You can also use a spectrum analyzer, which is a, a fantastic tool and most events are using both. A spectrum analyzer sees a wider range typically, and uh, but isn't quite as sensitive. And then your receivers are seeing what your antennas are actually seeing. And mm -hmm. it, it, some of the differences are, are pretty interesting. Uh, but one thing I wanna jump into uh, before we go too far into coordination, and I know some of that'll get real technical, but matching the local spectrum, but thinking about your, your system and what I would call band planning. This is figuring out what hardware you have and what ranges it can tune into. And the hardware in the last few years has changed a lot. And the tuning ranges have expanded quite a bit to where they typically overlap a lot now. Um, and I'm showing our systems up here, the Duet you know, uh, Digital IEM covers 470 to 608. And then our Venue 2 type uh, systems is a modular receiver system. And each one of those covers about 75 meg. So it's very easy for these to overlap. And one of the keys to band planning is that you want to try to keep your in-ears and IFBs and comm systems separate from your talent mics. And the more important the talent mic, like your on-screen, you know, diva singer at the big event, you want to keep as much free spectrum and clear spectrum for that person. So one of the ways that you can do that is sort of restricting the ranges uh, that you might be tuning each of these devices into. So here's an example using those same uh, hardware platforms, but kind of sequestering, if you will, each of their tuning ranges into areas where they don't step on each other. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of the basics of band planning is figure out what available spectrum you have and what hardware you have, and then figuring out how to make sure the hardware doesn't step on, on uh, itself. Right, so you're given, um, certainly one of the tips there is to give priority to your talent, right? To your main talent mics, whether yes. it's ears or uh, microphones, right? Yes, and, and the reason for that is the talent, you know, you need high fidelity, zero latency audio. The best fidelity that you can get, the uh, zero dropouts if possible. And, you know, when it comes to comms and other systems, you want that as well, but it's less of a priority because it's not going out to the public. You know, it's going to your tech team. So, you know, a bit of latency in your comm system, uh, you know, restricted bandwidth for your IFBs and your foldbacks and so on. That's okay. You can still hear what you know, the director is calling or what the camera uh, and lights are calling. Uh, but the talent, the on-screen talent needs the absolute priority frequencies, the best right. ones that you have available. And then it would go down, you know, in the pecking order from there. So uh, let's let's stay on the scanning and the, the examining your environment here for just a second. I, you know, I noticed you were saying that uh, you were doing the evaluation of it on your uh, on your receiver itself and I, right. I mean is there is it advantage or is it kind of uh, how do I want to say this is that advantage neutralized a little bit by using your existing antenna system to to evaluate that 
right? Are you better right. off using a spectrum analyzer that is going to fully analyze the entire spectrum around you, or are you are you better off using the receiver and your antenna system to do it? I see them as different tools. I think yeah. the spectrum analyzer is a, a critical tool for larger jobs in particular, but it won't see certain things. Uh, and we'll get into this more with coordination. I'm sure Joe will want to jump in and talk about intermods, and, and uh, you know I can comment on that as well. Uh, but when you're using your receivers and your antenna system to do these scans, you're seeing what those receivers see, which is really uh, what you need to look at. Um, James Stoffo, one of the great industry, you know, frequency coordinators and gurus on the subject, always says, you know, look at the world through the eyes of the receiver to start with. <laughs> and, and that's really important because your antenna system may have uh, noise in it. It may have uh, intermods generated within the antenna system uh, that the spectrum analyzer won't see. Yeah. So comparing those two is often a fascinating thing to see. Oh, look at this. There's a couple anomalies that my receivers are seeing that the spectrum analyzer is not seeing. I still have to avoid them, you know, because it's the receivers that count. Well, it, it kind of occurs to me that if you're going to use your receiver to do that analysis, it's pretty dependent upon you having your antenna system, et cetera, set up and optimized before you start doing the analysis. Is that right? Absolutely. So it's yes, kind of it a, is. Which, came, which comes first, chicken or the egg there, right? Although you may discover things that, that you need to fix, and we'll talk about RF gain structure, but if you're driving your ant, you know, if you're driving the RF into your receivers a little too hot, you might see that. Those scans might look a lot dirtier with a very high noise floor, and you might wonder why. And it turns out, oh, well, we used a very long coax cable on a job a couple of weeks ago, and we boosted up the RF amps and the antennas really hot, and now that's driving the receivers too hot. Yeah. So you could back it off. There, again, spec and wouldn't see that. But your receivers will. Right, right. Good point. Great point. All right, uh, let's get... Uh, I'm going to bring in Jason here. I, I, I'm really fascinated to hear what he has to say here because, uh, you know, obviously he's working on some of these big television shows, et cetera. And, uh, you know, those are just... Those environments typically are just rife with RF interferences. So, Jason, give kind of give us your take on this frequency coordination issue and... Then we'll yeah. collectively jump into intermodulation here. So, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, Carl, Carl's nailed it on the head in, in terms of the, the first thing that I would always do uh, when I was in the field was to do my best to understand what the environment was going to look like statically, right? So, if you have the ability to go take a scan yourself ahead of time, that's obviously the the most sought after um, solution to get on site uh, and take a, a scan and ingest that information. Um, obviously, this is a static scan that's a uh, long term ahead of the event. So the amount of RF that you're seeing may not accurately represent. But if you can't do that, there's a number of tools that will allow you to kind of understand, first off, what DTV exists in that city or that space. Um, I, to my knowledge, all the manufacturers there have a database or, or there's the FCC database as well that you can pull um, DTV information from. And that's kind of a really good starting point to say, hey, this is where we're not going to operate. Um, and then, Carl, you mentioned band planning, right? So the next thing is to understand how many channels do I need to operate uh, of everything. So you start to look at the picture of comms, mics, in-ears, IFBs, whatever it may be, uh, and you start to paint a picture uh, of, you know, I need X amount of mics and I need X amount of ears and I need X amount of PLs. How can I make all of these things have their own kind of spectrum chunk uh, so that they're isolated and separated but still have a good noise floor to operate in? So uh, that can become really challenging in, in what is uh, very congested spaces. Um, and there's some nifty tools to solve those things. But that's kind of where you start, right? You, you want to make sure that you know what your inventory is going to be and what your landscape looks like. Uh, and then you start allocating real estate, as I like to call it. And as Joe mentioned earlier, uh, you know, advocating for RF real estate is a huge deal. And, and that paper that he put in um, to sign, please take it some time to do that because we are losing real estate uh, and it's important we do that. But uh, I, I know we covered that earlier. But now you start to allocate your real estate. So what are, what are my money mics, right? Are my, what are my money ears? What are the most important things that have to function? Um, and I know, right, everything should should have to function, but you can make a hierarchy. Uh, of those things if you have to based on your environment. So now you start picking out what is the best noise floor based on your scan and you start allocating gear that will work in that space. Um, and usually uh, I would start with what was the most difficult piece of gear 
that was also the most important. So what I mean by that is in the old days, you had uh, Telex BTRs that were very tight in the space they could occupy. And I had to have four of those belt packs function for my main stage managers, right? That was fairly important. Uh, and those were very hard to coordinate. And they had you know three TV channels that they worked in. So I would start there. Because uh, generally speaking, uh, the analog or some of the older mic systems had a larger bandwidth than that. Um, so you start with what's most difficult and most important, and you kind of work backwards to least important and uh, widest operating bandwidth, if you will, because those will be able to slot into much more spaces. You know, if you start with the, the easy stuff or the wide bandwidth tuning devices and you pigeonhole yourself in at the end and you've already got, you know, 100 channels of frequencies coordinated and then your last device is the one that only has six megahertz of space to work in, you're probably not going to get that device to work in the coordination. Um, and then you're starting over because you have to change a bunch of things to get that last piece to work, right? And this can be frustrating for new coordinators where they get to the end of something that they thought they've done really, really well and they have to start over. So uh, I always tell people to remember that when they start to coordinate. Start with stuff that's got the least amount of bandwidth. Um, that would be my quick tips. Yeah. Right? So, you know, one of the things that comes to mind when we talk about this frequency coordination issue and e even these scanning issues and, you know, searching for space is, and, and I'll use kind of concert touring as an example here, you know, where we have to be kind of nimble with how we do that. And, and I'm going to refer back to some situations that I, I can remember this happening three, four years ago where... You know, the interference that was being caused wasn't necessarily coming from outside the building or outside the world. It was coming from the production itself, meaning, you know, these I got a 60 foot IMAG wall, you know, that's, you know, with these, you know, these video panels up there that are just spewing RF everywhere out on the stage, you know, uh, you know, so my, my point being, OK, well, if we do that scan in the morning before that wall's built and operating, and then it goes up and all of a sudden we got all kinds of problems, you know, how nimble, I mean, that, that kind of speaks to us having to be nimble to be able to change things pretty quickly, right? I mean, is that realistic? That we, What I'm talking about there, is that real issues? Absolutely, Robert. Absolutely. Um, yeah, video walls are a big deal and other kinds of RF sources on the stage and they are, uh, many of them interact. Uh, yeah. And that's, yeah. that becomes the art of frequency coordination, which is, you know, there's the theory and then the practice and you know what they say, in theory, they're the same, practice, they're not. <laughs> Well, I remember, you know, I, I'll, I'll speak at, maybe I'll have Volker come in on this after I'm done with this little statement here. You know, speaking from a, the, the perspective of a manufacturer, I remember when we were building the first venue systems and doing RF analysis for RF spill outside of the units that we were building. And, you know, just the things that we had to do to, to calm that down, and, and if we didn't do them, how much RF it was spreading out around it was was mind-blowing to me it was really eye-opening to me i just thought oh my gosh these are just hidden landmines everywhere in a show if this is not addressed properly by manufacturers and when we see a lot of, uh, video walls is the one i always come to because <laughs> it doesn't seem like there's much regulation going on there in terms of how much rf is being put out by these things and you know here you got you know poor monitor guys and rf guys trying to get ears and mics and you know guitars working standing right in front of all these things you know so Volker, I've, I, got a, I've got a quick story on that, and that that I tell a lot when this comes up. And I was doing a gig. It was a, a holiday taping special. And we were about, I don't know, 90 minutes prior to, to you know, downbeat. And uh, out of nowhere, my, the whole RF rack just lit up like a Christmas tree. I mean, yeah. like every, every meter was pegged. Um, and uh, things were fairly uh, loud in terms of OES, other electronics on stage in terms of LED walls and lighting, and they had been for some time. Um, and this is kind of where my spectrum analyzer saved me, and, and we can talk about tools and what, what makes sense. But uh, I couldn't see uh, this interference through my antenna system, through my DA, and my spectrum analyzer was in my DA, in line. Um, uh, but my receivers were lit up like a Christmas tree. And so this is kind of ties into what Carl was talking about. So until I uh, externalized an antenna and plugged it straight into my um, spectrum analyzer and realized that the radiation was coming from my rack, uh, and it took a while walking around with an antenna, um, I had a rope light that I had in the back of the rack that was plugged in that allowed me to see in the back of the rack to plug stuff in and unplug stuff. And it was an old, uh, old rope light that had been there for a long time. Uh, and... 
Uh, as soon as I unplugged that rope light, everything went back to normal. <laughs> uh, everything in that rope light had arced, and uh, it took a while to figure it out, and I was sweating bullets, but like, have the tools and know what can cause interference. Yeah, That's I scary, love it. Buddy, but it's, it's a good story to plug in, plug in right there. We made it. but Well, I, I mean, sweating. it just goes to show you how, you know, we can't see any of these gremlins before they happen, you know, until we have yeah. something like that. So, yeah, that's great. Volker, can you uh, add anything to the conversation here? I'm sure you can, so I'm just going to ask you to do so. Um, I think whatever Carl and, and Jason mentioned, that's all awfully right. Um, let's face it, there's a lot of RF noise generated by ourselves. Moving lights, video walls, you name it, video floors, oh my gosh, um, it's getting really tricky. So we have to admit over the last five years, video walls were significantly improved. So they are less noisy than they were in the past. That's good to hear. Um, the, the good thing, Jason, they are all certified. They are all certified for one panel. And then if you put <laughs> 50, 60, 100 right. of them together, <laughs> woof, you have this beautiful effect. And, and uh, um, for, for me, if I have the chance in an ideal world, if I have a big production, uh, what Jason mentioned, let's go ahead of time into the venue, do some measurements. Yeah. Do some measurements with the antenna system which you want to use and the receiver you want to use. And in addition, take your spectrum analyzer because you want to see what's below and above the range. Okay, Do this twice, three times a day, early in the morning, noon, in the afternoon. If you have the chance go and see what's happening throughout another production. So those ideas, and as Carl mentioned, a spectrum analyzer, different properties, different tool. In my opinion, I completely agree. The best ears are the antennas for the receivers. Yeah. So they see what the receivers are seeing. So that's, that's the way to go. But you want to know if there is something below 470 which might spill over, right? And we had cases in, I had cases in Japan where they did some crazy stuff with cell phones and, and you had the spillover. You couldn't see it in the, you saw it in the spectrum, in the, in the receiver, but you can pinpoint it with the spectrum rather much easier. Volker, is it, is it fair to say that one of the reasons you might want to do spectrum analysis to find stuff that is outside your projected band is so that there's that you can offset intermodulation coming from outside the band. If it is generated intermodulation from yourself, yeah. So that's that's one way to look at it. Yeah. Um, if the frequency coordination is really bad, so then you have to take care about that, uh, because you want to plan, as Jason mentioned, you want to plan in blocks, and if there is an intermodulation due to whatever reason. It should not fall into the other block in an ideal world scenario if we have enough space, yeah. right? Well, let's let's just move forward with that. As, as you guys can see, we're 35 minutes in, right? We haven't even got off the first topic yet. We could be here till Wednesday. But, I, you know, what I want you guys to talk about is this concept of intermodulation. And, and for those that are less experienced with wireless in the, in the audience today, please just try to help us understand what intermodulation is what we're looking for and why it is a problem. Okay, so uh, Volker, I left off with you. I'll just start with you this time uh, on that particular part of it. Why don't you take that if you can? If you've got um, documents to back it up, you know, maybe Joe can throw them up or something and we can talk people through this because it's mathematical, um, right? It, it is physics. Yeah. And, yeah. and gems, ladies, it's for every transmitter, every receiver, every antenna booster the same theory. Some designs are better, some are not as good. Older devices more susceptible to intermodulation. In general, the concept is if two transmitters in close prox for instance, transmitters, if two transmitters in close proximity uh, are talking to each other because this antenna, which you see on top of this body pack, is not only a transmitter uh, antenna, it's also a receiving antenna at the same time. And if we see the signal from the other transmitter inside my RF 
amplifier. Two or more signals of sufficient strength drive a nonlinear device like a transistor, an RF amplifier, into nonlinear operation. And this creates intermodulation. And this, Joe, if I may, uh, I would like to share with you a little bit of my favorite one. And I think you can see this now, right? Yeah. Hey, Look this is my this is my favorite toy. My favorite buddy when I'm traveling. <laughs> so I leave my wife at home and take my spectrum <laughs> with me. This is being recorded, analyzer, just so you know. Going to play um, out. Just she saying. knows what I'm thinking. <laughs> my spectrum analyzer never asked for the credit card to get new shoes. Okay, so this is the RF noise floor in the beautiful city of Hanover here in the northern part of Germany. Man, it's a walk in the park. So it's really nice. If I turn on my transmitter, here we go. This is what you see. And what you saw at the beginning, gents, ladies, this was a mistake because I'm overloading my front end of my spectrum analyzer. Keep this in mind. You have to know what you are measuring. So if I turn on a second transmitter in a little bit further away proximity, here we go. Here's my second transmitter. So you can tell from the spectrum scan, this one is closer to my receiving antenna. Because this is a concept. As soon as I'm walking away from my receiving antenna, my signal is getting smaller. This is like listening with your ears. When I talk to you face to face, I turn around and walk away, my signal is getting smaller. The noise floor, which you see here, stays the same. So that means at the end, signal to noise ratio is getting smaller. And my receiver needs a certain amount of signal to noise. Doesn't matter if it's analog or digital. So needs a certain amount of signal to noise to understand and demodulate the signal. That's the same if I talk to you, I walk away at a certain point in time, signal is so small, you cannot demodulate this anymore. So now, what do you see? I see two carriers, great. Um, if I bring a, the second carrier in close proximity to the first one, and I will put them all together on each other, like this, here we go. And this is a trick, okay? So I did some manipulation on the devices. But what you see here, this is intermodulation product. This is the intermodulation product third order. This is the difference between carrier one and carrier two. As simple as this. This is math, pure mathematics. So this frequency we in general cannot use. We should not use. If we need to use it because we don't have other spectrum, we have to be aware that my carrier to noise ratio now is carrier to interference, to this noise ratio. So it's getting smaller. So that means at the end of the day, at the end of the day, my coverage is getting smaller. I hear this birdie noise in analog transmission and for digital, I hear earlier dropouts. Keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that what you keep keep in mind that an analog system generates intermodulation, a digital system do the same. So because it is no difference between analog and digital, unless the design is different. And you can influence this with less RF power, RF output power. So then you can produce less intermodulation, but no free lunch. In this case, you have less coverage. So uh, is it fair to say, Volker, that uh, I'll, I'll just say the majority of the manufacturers g give you a lot of tools to really help you, help keep you from making this intermodulation mistake with grouping, and mm -hmm. things like that within their own systems. But 
where you obviously need to stay abreast of it is if you're mixing systems in your production, right? If you, maybe I have some, maybe I have ear monitors from Shure, maybe I have microphones from right. Sennheiser, mm -hmm. maybe I have you know wireless analyzer mics from Electrosonics, you know, whatever. Yeah. I, I'm just shooting from mm -hmm. the hip here, but obviously you need to be aware if all of those things are going to work together at the same time, right? Then you have to and be re-aware of it. And, and that's absolutely true. And then Carl and Jason as the specialists come into play and they have to be the gurus to coordinate the entire system. Right. What right. you can do, so this is the reason why most of us, Electro, Shure, Sennheiser, we have this bank and channel concept. So where we put into one bank let's say 15, 16 wireless microphone frequencies, and they are coordinated among themselves. If you take five channels out of bank one and three channels out of bank two, not a good idea because they might not be coordinated among themselves. Right, right. That's where I was going with that. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, so maybe we'll kind of wrap up here unless somebody has something really hot that they want to add to this. I, can you guys uh, maybe in the background here somewhere maybe provide some links maybe to some actual equipment, maybe some analyzer equipment th that you would recommend for people to use out in the field to do this kind of stuff? You guys in the audience, you're welcome to post links in the chat as well if you know of some great uh, analysis gear to take along with you and start you know, doing your own frequency scans on site, etc. So. Uh, Feel free to post that if you can, and maybe maybe while you're doing that, I'll, I'll just move on to another topic uh, to save us a little time here. Because as you're going to see, all of these topics are inter interrelated. Go ahead, Volker. You, were you going to add something? I'm, I just want to make one thing very clear, and I hope that's the same understanding for Carl and Jason. If you spend the money for a spectrum analyzer, um, you get what you pay for, right? So <laughs> if you have a bad one, those cheap 300 bucks devices, you will measure everything else, but not the real life. <laughs> so for that reason, there is a reason why a Rode and Schwarz spectrum analyzer costs 80,000 bucks. There is a good reason for that. So my one, which I have and which I just use, the Tektronix one, a great tool. The dynamic range at the input is a disaster. So you have to be aware of that. The good thing with this one is it is just, it looks like a hard drive. Yeah. No complaints at the airport. Go to the security, <laughs> go, go <laughs> to security and explain this is a spectrum analyzer. Uh, oh my gosh, did this got the t-shirt, thank you. <laughs> Jason, you're smiling, right? <laughs> Do you guys, I, I'll just throw this out there. Again, this is not my area of expertise. So I'm just, I'm again, just shooting from the hip here. Are there, Software applications that you can interface hardware to your computer to do analysis? And, you know, and if so, what hardware do you need to actually interface to your computer to be able to do it? I can jump on that, Robert. I just posted something. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's right. You're up. Go ahead. Uh, you're clear, Carl. Go ahead. Oh, I hear someone else. Oh, that's, oh, yeah. So um, I just posted a link to our wireless designer, which is a software package that we offer. Uh, and there's uh, every manufacturer of a, of a system like ours would have something like this. There's Sears Wireless Workbench, there's uh, Sennheiser Spectrum Manager, and so on. And, you know, what we didn't quite get into is the fact that, you know, these intermods begin to really pile up when you've got a lot of different wireless yeah. going on a particular set. So I'll just show one quick thing here that's kind of interesting. I think it's unique to our software, but what it does is it, um, it lets you uh, kind of see Here's some carriers. I've got four carriers up here. And then the orange lines down here that look very similar to what Volker was showing. These are third order intermods. And then the light blue lines are fifth order. What's kind of fun to do, and it really shows you how these things will interact, is that you can grab these carriers and it'll tell you what the frequency it is. And as you move them around, you can see the relationships moving between the intermods. And as I land on one, it's warning me that, hey, I've landed my carrier for this wireless mic on a fifth order product from somewhere else. And if I get onto one of these third orders, you'll see that not only did it, it kind of mess up uh, this channel that I'm moving, but now the other four wireless mics would be affected by this particular frequency choice between the four of them. So it gets very, very messy. This is only four carriers. And as you add more, it 
it expands at an, an incredible rate to millions of intermods that you're trying to avoid. So this is why you can't really just guess and right. try moving to different frequencies because each one of those could affect other channels that are nearby as well. So I put the link in there. People can download the software and run it offline and play around with this intermod calculator to get a feel for what's happening when you're running multiple wireless mic channels and, uh, and try for themselves and see how the interactions happen. That's great. That's awesome stuff. Well, I mean, that'll take us right to the end of this topic then, because I'm going to ask each one of you guys, uh, if you could, just give, just give us one practical tip or best idea when you walk in during the day, how to avoid an intermodulation problem, right? We won't, we won't talk about the RF problem. You know, I think we got that one in terms of, you know, just knowing the environment you're in and analyzing that, but just maybe one tip to avoid intermodulation, causing your own car wreck, so to speak. I'll start. It's important to understand that intermodulation doesn't happen in the air. It happens in amplification stages. So if you do have proper gain structure, that is an excellent way to avoid a lot of intermodulation problems. Great Thank tip. You. Yeah. Awesome. And bigger is not better. I know specifically in the North Americas, guys, you are great and bigger is better because, <laughs> hey, it's no, sorry. So you simply need the RF output power of your transmitter to cover plus some margin the area which you want to cover, right? So that's it. If you turn up your RF output power to 100 milliwatt, what you can do in the US, fine. Um, it often causes more trouble than anything else. Yeah. So if you have the chance, lower is better, lower yeah. RF output power. Well, well, we'll get to that obviously at the end here too. Yeah, so great. <laughs> Jason, go ahead, man. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to steal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat here. I'm going to give you two. One, coordinate. Use the software coordinate just everybody's got one there's a ton that are free put your put your stuff in there and coordinate and then two uh the the old james stuffo uh 10 10 can trick i guess if you've got a bunch of transmitters on a table um what's you know what he showed where you get those antennas close and you create a bunch of intermods don't put a bunch of transmitters that are on on a table right next to each other you've just created an intermod farm yeah. um, and this is where we some of you may have seen the photos of like the bread tins that are uh, aluminum and therefore shielding and you put the they're not for organization they're so that the antenna is below a little metal wall which prevents some intermod so that's a quick a quick uh, easy a2 tool throw out some tins on a table and put your transmitters in there that's fantastic i mean that's what we're looking for that kind of stuff right there you know some real meat and potatoes <laughs> How to, save me please right yeah. use the tins yes yeah. uh carl last chance you want to add anything to that before we move on these guys have covered it really well, but I want to uh, reiterate something that Volker was talking about. It has to do with signal to noise. That's what you want to look for. Yes, you can use low power as long as you've got a low noise floor. Sometimes more power is required, but ultimately it's about signal to noise, your desired signal over the noise floor to get things to happen. But uh, to echo what Jason said, learn the software. We've all got packages. This is how you come to really understand the relationship of intermods. And for multiple <coughs> channel systems, it is a must anymore. Yeah. Great. Awesome, guys. Absolutely great stuff there. All right, let's let's uh, let's move on to uh, stuff that is a little more meat and potatoes, a little more hands-on here uh, in terms of hardware. Let's talk, uh, let's jump into receiver and antenna placements, okay? And this is one that I see so much, oh, I don't know what, a, I, not consternation, not conflict, but just so many approaches and so many mindsets about this. And it doesn't, it's one of those things that doesn't necessarily feel like it should be this way. It feels like it should be relatively straightforward with some uh some ideas of how to avoid interference or, or cause my own problems right so we're going to we're going to jump into the topic of receiver and antenna placement kind of do's and don'ts here uh so jason i'm going to let you lead this one I, you know because i know you have done a ton of work in this kind of environment so you know i'll start just by asking a couple of questions to get the topic started here so you know when we're setting up antennas and stuff what what kind of objects actually kind of qualify as credible potential interference objects you know i 
can I sit up behind chain link fence or should I set up in front of chain link fence? Is it, you know, we are, we have already talked about the video wall, you know, should, uh, yeah. you know, you talked about your, your, uh, your rope, rope light. light. So <laughs> you're the man, we're, we're going to throw this one right in your court here. So go for nah, it. That's, that's a great question. Um, first and foremost, uh, line of sight is your best friend, right? So if you can create a physical line between antenna and the other antenna, whether it's transmit and receive or receive and transmit, um, that's going to be your 100% best case scenario almost every time. Yeah. Um, in terms of what surfaces does RF really dislike, metal is obviously the, the biggest offender. Um, and there's a lot of copper in, uh, in electronics. Therefore, most electronics are, uh, are an RF shield, if you will. Um, wood, drywall, drapery, some of that stuff um, is less offensive. Um, but also, you know, you go back to rule number one, which is line of sight is your, <laughs> is your best friend. So and you know, I, I'm going to ask you to clarify on that, too. When you say line of sight, uh, I, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll actually use a real world example here because I, I help out some uh, some sports teams around here, a couple of high schools in a football league, and they set up wireless yep. for the ref mics, et cetera. So when you say line of sight, do you mean ac actually at head height or does it matter? Can it be higher? Can it be lower? That's a, that it, it, I say, I always like to say, pretend your antenna is a spotlight. Would okay. your light reach the, reach the transmitter or receiver, mm -hmm. right? So a spotlight can be oriented above or below. Maybe if you're a lighting guy, you might say no, but, but in general, the light's going to make it, right? So um, I like to preach height is your friend um, in most scenarios because, you know, the, the RF coming off of whatever device, it's not like there's just one path, right? We're, we're talking about multiple paths coming out in almost all directions off of a, an antenna. So uh, it, in most cases, uh, anything below head height and, and where the transmitter is uh, has a lot of obstacles. And in uh, most cases, directly above, um, there's not a whole lot there except for other electronics. So if I, if I had the ability, I would fly an antenna below my electrics on a, on a stage. Now that's, that's maybe overkill and not, not doable for you, but that's where your best line of sight is, right? Um, and that's why you see some on, on the side of the stage, you'll see them up on, on large antennas because you're getting above those obstacles. So right. yeah, uh, that's your, really your number one rule. Make sure that if you looked directly behind that antenna, like, like a flashlight beam, can you see the majority of your receivers or transmitters, whichever direction we're going. Right. And it, uh, I mean, I'll just take you down the path here. So if we're yeah. talking about diversity and where we're using multiple antennas now, yep. are we looking to just aim at a specific geometry of the space? Right. Fantastic. Yeah. So I like to start with like why diversity? Um, and, and this kind of takes us down the multipath conversation. Um, and if we, to understand that, we talk about what is multipath. So a minute ago, I talked about how there's multiple um, radio waves coming off of one transmit antenna, right? It's not like there's just one path. So the question you have to ask yourself is if you had one antenna, what happens when path one hits this antenna at the exact same time as path 247? Uh, and those two paths happen to be directly out of phase at the same time that they hit that antenna. Do a dropout happens. Um, and that's where you get a neg and you can associate this to similar properties of audio um, with an in phase and out of, out of phase directly one out of the other. Um, so what they decided to do was add a second antenna. Uh, essentially, this is where diversity comes from. And the idea is that if your A antenna were to have a multipath issue where there was two waves hitting it that were directly out of phase, you would listen to the second antenna. Um, and so why this matters is uh, the initial best practice for placing your A and your B antenna is that you would have them at least a wavelength apart um, at minimum. And so the, the physics of this is that if, if one wavelength can mess up with one antenna at a, at a modulation dropout where you've got them out of phase and your second antenna is within that wavelength length, then both of those antennas are going to experience the same dropout likely. Yeah. Um, so you want to place your antennas more than one wavelength distance apart. And there's a rabbit hole there as well in terms of calculating wavelengths and how to understand what frequency is what distance. And, uh, you know, we can go down that rabbit hole if we want to. I, well, uh, I, I mean, I think it's important to contextualize it for audio people, right? I mean, correct. I mean, yes. wavelength is wavelength to some degree here. And the biggest distinction is that RF travels at the speed of light. So the math is different. Right. And right. the speed of sound. Um, so uh, in general, 
Uh, let, let me see if I can pull up a slide. If somebody else wants to hop in here and has... Actually, Joe, if you could stop sharing for one second, I'll uh, let Jason share his screen. Thank you. And we'll take it down here. Because, you know, it, it's always been a question for me, and I think you might have just clarified it for me, is, you know, if I'm going to put up two antennas for diversity, what should the spacing on it be? I mean, should I treat it like an XY pair of microphones and get them very close together but com covering different geometries? Or... Should I space them out really wide? You know, you know what, what's going to yeah, give me absolutely. the best chance of success there, right? Okay, can you see this? Yeah. Yep. All right. So here is the math for this, if you'd like to know it. Um, which uh, essentially the chart at the bottom will show you that uh, where we tend to live in the UHF, you see 400 to 600 is somewhere around two and a half uh, feet one and a half feet it's shorter as you get higher so you look at the wi-fi spectrum there 2.4 and 5 gig you're talking about less than half a foot when you get down to vhf you're closer to 10 feet at 100 meg um this is an, uh, another thing to, to mention here this is why vhf antennas are so large um you're talking about the physics of being able to capture that wavelength size so if you've ever had a vhf system you'll you notice that those antennas are just gigantic and then your little wi-fi antennas are significantly smaller that's not you know just some random choice that took place that is by design and by physics um so uh, if you were to take the overall of your system's entirety or whatever the the antennas we're talking about in this specific instance you could do some math and say hey the you know the center frequency and the lowest and the highest frequency and go ahead and figure out what the, the, the distance parameters there are uh, and that would be your minimum requirement for getting your antennas separated based on uh, intermod dropout potential. Um, that's not necessarily best practice, uh-oh, um, but that is definitely um, one way to go about understanding how far away. Um, mm -hmm. The next thing you talk about is uh, environment and what the physics of your environment are and what's practical in placing those antennas. So. Um, I like to get something on either side of the stage uh, that has line of sight that gives me a ton of diversity. Some people like to put them on, you know, an eight foot teeth bar and keep them separated. Both of those are acceptable based on math, uh, but all of these things change as you get into the actual specific environment that you want, that you're operating in. Uh, and this is just for receive. Uh, I, we, we haven't talked about the, the differences in receive antennas and transmit antennas, but I feel like I've been talking for an hour. So <laughs> we, else we're coming to, up right on an hour. <laughs> fire away. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, who wants to jump in there? Volker, let's get you in on this. I, you know, I know this is really in your wheelhouse here. So and, and to be very honest, Jason nailed it down. So great. It is great. at the end of the day, a question of experience and philosophy. So I personally, if I have a theater or a touring production, I prefer to have specifically for touring production antennas left and right of the stage facing to the center. So lots of diversity, interesting switching, lots of switching. That's a healthy system for me. Other people say differently. There are some people who say, hey, I do not want to see the switching at all. So. Mm, for me, not a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Why we are not doing this in the touring production? Because people are lazy. <laughs> they don't want to run cable. To you got us figured side. out, Walker. You Come on, guys. You discovered so us. Thank you. It's, it's so, the laziest industry there is, really. I mean, yeah. no, no, no. And that's the same here, by the way, right? So if yeah. I, <laughs> I don't want to run a high quality cable because the other side of the stage is the much longer cable run so i need a lower loss cable in total oh my gosh this is heavy this is bulky this is not fun you want to run this every night no so yeah. for that reason you see it very often at one side of monitor world and yeah see if i if i if that ended up being the reason for me you know where somebody said well, i just didn't feel like running the cable i'm like you know given what's at stake for that wireless compared to all the other cables you're going to run during the day, that's the one you should be running. Okay, so I, you know, let's let's take that approach. And what this do you say? Is the, and this is a cable where you should spend the money for. I mean, it, it, it. well, okay, that brings up another point here, and we may stick on this for a little bit here. Do I need to be aware of where I run that cable? Meaning what other EM, you know, EMF 
cabling is you know running alongside it maybe crossing it well you know all of those situations are we creating interference that can come into the cable let alone the antenna Carl you want to take this uh, sure <laughs> you don't sound confident <laughs> uh, <laughs> well Sorry. In, Sorry. in general if, if you're running good quality cable and the cables in good condition uh, that's not generally an issue you have to worry about too much. I mean, obviously, you don't want to run it next to something that's going to melt the jacket or, you know, you don't want to run over it with a forklift. I mean, just how you want to treat your mic cables, you would generally want to treat your... Yep. Yeah, I uh, guess what I want with that is in big productions, I mean, we have we have the potential for some serious current flow to be happening in places yeah. and you know, projecting some pretty good EMF there, you know, so... Uh, yeah, and you might look for some induced currents and so on and avoid that, you know, avoid ground loops and so on. But, I mean, if you're running from a receiver out to an antenna and it's, you know, a passive antenna, that there's no ground loop on that end. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's not something that, that I've run into very much, um, but I do want to point out a couple don'ts, if you will. Uh, so let me, uh, this is one of my favorite slides recently uh, for antenna placement. And it, it has to do with... Uh, the thing we talked about just a minute ago was how do you avoid stepping on yourself? Right. And everyone can see this here. Um, this is not an untypical situation on a film set. And what's interesting about it is we see almost everybody represented here manufacturer wise, you know, there's a third party <laughs> antenna from Betso with an amplifier in it. There's a passive uh, electro in the middle there. There's a Sennheiser uh, dome helical in the middle there and then a, a VHF modified antenna on the far end. So th these are all four antennas within about four feet of each other or less. And uh, some of them are transmit and some of them are receive antennas. Very much a don't uh, because your transmit antennas will, will pound the front end of your receivers. So the first thing I suggested when uh, seeing this setup was separate your transmit from your receive antennas. That's a big deal right away. And then know your polar patterns so that you can kind of work within, just like microphones, you know, if, if someone's got a single monitor wedge, and this is in the days when we had monitor wedges, you might use a cardioid mic, which has a strong null to the rear of the mic. But if someone likes to have two wedges, uh, then you might use a hypercardioid or supercardioid to, uh, so just being aware of the, of the patterns and using that to your advantage makes a big difference. Um, I mean, this I'm, is a that, that's a great one, Carl. I, I mean, we got to stay on that one for just a second, because I, I sure. just got to tell you, I cannot tell you, I couldn't count how many times I've walked into a monitor world and seen yeah. ear transmitters and wireless microphone receiver antennas all on the same stand, sitting yeah. right in, right yeah. on the same stand with each very other. Common, you know? Very common, very common. And, and like, disastrous. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I, even even me, the minion, kind of going, are you sure you want to do that? Is that right? Yeah. No, it, okay. it's very I, bad I'll, practice. I'll, I'll go back to front of house, okay, but I'm expecting yeah. this to work, so... Yeah, why I've seen it fail live on, on major acts. Yeah. Why we are doing this, Carl? Sorry, because we are lazy. Yeah, it's back to that lazy thing. They want to raise one stand, and, and the feeling is, you know, they can they can roll around with a cart, or in well, the case of mo monitor land, you know, it's they plop one stand out there and, and figure it it's done. And well, it's, and it's, and in defense of them, I would say, you know, there's other pressures on them for line of sight. Etc. Yeah. from audience members, you know, that, that may be seated around them, et cetera. So, you know, I'll give them a little little bit of rope on it, but boy, talk about cutting your own throat here. I mean, when you No, it's that. back to what you said before, though. Where are the priorities? Right. You know, right. and the, the funny flip side of this is the wireless mics get blamed when every, when anything goes wrong. You, you hear a sudden, like, zap in the, in the audio, and, and they turn around and look at the guy running the, the wireless mics, and it's oh, like... Oh, believe me, I've blamed plenty of my mistakes on wireless, sure. so that's, yeah. that's fine, yeah. So <laughs> we should not make it easy to blame <laughs> yeah there you go. i mean there if you nothing go. else uh this one more quick slide here and this is another don't this is very common you know uh, jason was talking about uh you know electronics being a good block you know you're talking about metal chassis and of course the uh robert you mentioned all the spill that comes from everything with a dsp in it and a cpu and anything else and pretty much everything now is computed with some knobs and leds yeah. on the front and an audio jack and so here is a couple of antennas, uh, not one wavelength apart, and uh, parallel to the floor, which is the wrong orientation, our, our stuff is vertically oriented, or vertically polarized, and in an equipment cabinet with all this other crap. So you can only imagine that, that this didn't work well. And, and down here, notice <laughs> there's, there's some kind of video uh, processor down here too. It's probably one of the worst offenders in this whole rack. 
in terms of our RF spill. And needless to say, th this situation was improved trem tremendously by simply remoting those antennas. It, right. it worked versus not working at all. Well, I mean, I'll spill the beans on, you know, with regard to our console stuff. You know, in, in the original days of uh, the first venue console, we had an FOH rack that had a front panel on it, steel front panel, and you would take that off to access DSP cards if you were going to change yeah. the center. And there were 12 screws to take this off. And everybody used to ask, dude, why so many screws on this panel to take it off? Well, the difference in RF bleed out of that rack with four screws compared to 12 screws was just like, four screws was just like, you might as well not even put the panel on, you know, because it didn't seal it down and make it right. a steel structure. So, you know, it was hard to explain. It, again, that's the kind of thing you can't see it, so you don't know it's the devil, you know. Uh, but we had to explain to people, please, please put all the screws back in. You know, you're asking for trouble, especially for guys in monitor world, man, the RF bleed out of that computer was mind blowing, so. Uh, Jason, anything you want to add there? I, I, we're going to stay on this for just a little bit, but uh, please, if you got something to add there, please jump in. Um, I think if we kind of do what we did earlier, what's the, what's the uh, you know, for me, what's the one thing that I see with the, the most uh, gregarious offense is what Carl just mentioned. And you'll walk into a venue and they'll say, oh, my receiver's RF is through the roof and nothing's on. And I'll go turn off their <laughs> transmit. <laughs> and everything will clean right up. And I'll right. go, okay, where's your transmit antenna? And it's, you know, a directional antenna that's directly behind a omni dipole staring at one another and you're just blowing up yourself right yeah, yeah. Um, and we talked about intermods earlier and if you do the math on what uh, you know an eight pack of transmit ears how many intermods exist there uh, and what you're sending out of that high transmit antenna is is pretty disastrous so um, if you're going to talk about antenna setup it's do the math on your receive to make sure that you're one wavelength apart and make sure your transmit antenna is physically as far away as possible and practical from your receive antennas. <laughs> I like it. I mean, yeah. fellas, if you take away any one today, that might be the one. All right. So, uh, yeah, Volker, go. I, I'm, I'm going to come to all have, of you for this as well. So let's I, let's I have, have a best uh, Jason, best tip because I know he loves that. So <laughs> this is what what Jason described is the challenge of dynamic range for a receiver. If you have the transmit antenna for your in use behind your receiver antenna. So, hey, this is what's happening. So this is my wanted signal, okay? And you can see that, right? Now I take a much stronger signal from <laughs> behind and you don't see the wanted signal anymore. Done, overload. So dynamic range is not big enough. So, and this is pretty normal. So. If you make such kind of mis mistakes, you're losing the receiving system, the receiving antenna, uh, and it's done. Right, right. Well, those are really, really great tips. Uh, Joe, you want to chime in there on a, you know, kind of a best practices for, uh, you know, receiver and transmitter antenna placement there? Well, I'd like to comment on something that uh, Carl said, because he rightfully mentioned the importance of polarization. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, if you hold a, uh, um, let's pretend this is a microphone. Um, if you hold a microphone here, and here's the antenna, you hold it straight up, basically, you're trying to capture the electric signal, which is running parallel to the antenna. So ideally, you want your receiver antenna to also be vertical, okay? However, you know, you're not always going, your performer's not always going to be holding the mic like this. He's going to be doing this and he's going to be jiving around. The polarization is going all over the place. So that's why um, on a receiver, if we're just going to use two monopole antennas, often, you know, you see them splayed out like this in a 45 degree angle. So this way, you're never fully wrong in terms of the polarization. That said, a great antenna to use is a circularly polarized antenna. That's that dome antenna. So it's not only directional, but it's circularly polarized, so it doesn't really matter which way your transmit antenna is pointing. So that's, you know, very good, especially if, if you have someone like Beyonce who's dancing all over the place. The polarization is going crazy. Thank right. you. 
That's awesome. Yeah, that's a gr great, great insight there. Uh, let's see, Carl. So I got you on this, right? We we're, did I get through everybody there on that particular topic? Just want to add I, something, if, if I may. Yeah, go. So one of the most common things that I run into, along with the, the a bunch of antennas on a mast problem, is uh, I would call it a little bit the monkey see, monkey do thing. You know, people see the the directional antennas; they're cool looking. And they figure, hey, I got to have those. I got to amplify my antennas. I got to have a hot signal. And as Volker mentioned before, on the transmit side, which is definitely true, you know, signal to noise counts, uh, but your receivers want to see a particular amount of RF. Too much is a bad thing, as Volker demonstrated with a flashlight. You get you get a lot of energy pounding in there, and suddenly it's a mess. The receivers can't do their job. So uh, I would say over amplification of the receiver antennas is the most common thing I hear about. And in almost every case where someone says, hey, we got the system set up and we're doing a frequency coordination and everything is just not working that well, I say, so what antennas do you have? Do you have RF amplifiers? How are they set? And what kind of cables are you using? And we talked a little bit before about cable loss, <clears throat> and that's the main reason to use RF amplification at the antennas is to overcome the loss in the cables. But you might have shorter cables or very low loss cables, and you're still boosting the signal, and that's going to pound those receivers and generate more intermods in that antenna system so you know passive is massive as we say you know everything in the system that can be passive should be and a little bit of loss is pref preferable to too much gain so one of the most common things that we recommend is uh filtering and attenuation i'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about filtering as we get further into this but attenuation is the number one tool i'm recommending these days and most of these antennas that have an amplifier on them have some amount of attenuation that you can throw at the signal or to cut the signal a little bit and part of the reason for that is simply that directional antennas have built-in passive gain already. So if you've got one of these shark fin type or paddle antennas, bat wing, whatever they're called, uh, they have a passive gain of something like 4 or 5 dB in the frequency range that we're using. So if you're using one of those antennas with a short low loss cable, you've got 4 or 5 dB too much signal. That's not good. So I say that you want to be between 0 dB at your receivers and minus 6. And minus six is these days, you know, you're going to be bringing your noise floor down by by doing that. Again, back to signal to noise is what counts. More power is not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, we're going to I hope I, I want to re definitely reserve some time to talk about RF gain structure here, because I, I think this is one of those issues. <laughs> and Volker probably said it best. You know, here in America, everything bigger is better. Well, not necessarily. I, I, I think this is at the heart of so many RF problems I see. I, I mean, I give you my own one little bitty example here where we were uh, we were trying to do a referee mic on a football field, you know, 100 yards, blah, 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 had a wireless system there, and they were having some dropout issues, and they decided to go to an antenna, you know, an extended antenna system as opposed to just the little uh, diversity system. And it was way worse. It was way worse. What the solution was, was to get the, the receiver out into some clear visual space, put this, the antennas at 45 degrees, and it worked like an absolute charm. I mean, it was just, we didn't have a dropout anywhere in that stadium with that referee mic. But with the, the paddle antennas and everything else up, it was worse. It was worse. It was just a poor implementation of it, you know. So uh, I'm sure we're going to get to that here, hopefully. All right. If it's okay with you guys, we're going to move on here because I'm going to we're going to definitely run over time here just a little bit. Uh, but obviously, we're talking about receiver uh, antenna placements and uh, transmitter antenna placements, etc. But I think it's also worth uh, kind of touching on, um, you know, kind of kind of a best spacing or best concepts uh, idea for transmitters that are body worn. Uh, Etc. You know, this is this has got to be a real problem in uh, certainly in some musical acts for sure, where it causes some serious problems here. Like, like I, I mean, I I know you guys in this audience have seen this, where you might have a performer that has two or three transmitters plus a receiver right on the same belt pack. You know, uh, what what kind of what kind of challenges do we have there? Are they solvable? What's what's a best practice there? You know, Carl, I'm going to start with you on this one. Let's 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 give you this one because I know you guys work a lot in theater for sure yeah we're and you, and you we're guys probably have more challenges movies. in yes. terms of transmitter antenna and where it should go what what yeah. polarization etc why don't you give us the lowdown yeah, well as, as these things get smaller and smaller you know they're they're easier and easier to hide on the body which is a good thing i mean most of our stuff is invisible uh like you say and it's a real issue um let me show a slide here this has got uh 
kind of a diagram. Uh, let's see here. Showing the polar pattern, you know, that you're dealing with when you've got a, a body worn transmitter. Oh, yeah. Uh, nice. And, you know, it acts just like a supercardioid uh, transmitter of, of its, you know, it is a transmitter, obviously. But, uh, you know, this is a real issue body absorption itself. Mm -hmm. And in the picture, it's shown well. You want to try to keep the antenna away from skin, for sure, the body itself. So keep it away from skin, direct contact, uh, damp undergarments. And there's a lot of tricks of the trade to aid with this, uh, using a piece of plastic tubing, uh, you know, a piece of foam, anything to insulate the antenna from the body. And uh, as long as it's able to radiate out into the room, one thing we haven't talked about too much, well, Jason mentioned it, but there's a lot of reflections. That's a good thing. This would become more difficult if you're outdoors and you've got an antenna that's in front of this performer that's a quite a distance away and no reflecting surfaces. That could be a, an issue. So that's something to also think about in terms of receiver placement, which I think was one of the reasons Volker mentioned, you know, he likes to have antennas on either side of the stage. So at least one of these antennas of the receiver side is going to see this transmit signal, despite, you know, where the person might be uh, pointing. So th that's one of the issues for sure that you have to watch for. And body absorption is a big deal. Uh, it's a bigger deal than a lot of people know. Uh, but they'll they'll call up and say, you know, uh, this worked great last week, and this week uh, it's not so good on the same frequency in the same place, and there's no new TV stations or whatever. And it's kind of like, well, did you put it on a different person, or did you put it in a different place? You know, they might say, oh, well, yeah, it's it's a larger, well-endowed lady, and the only place we could put it is kind of on her chest, you know, if you, you know what I'm saying. And it's like the, it's got no way to get the signal out of there. So it's one of the reasons why on theatricals, a lot of times they'll put the transmitter in the wig. So it's on top of the head and it's got a chance, you know, the wig is a relatively low absorptive material. So it's got a chance to radiate out. Um, ankle placement's another good one that's used a lot in TV and films. Uh, so a lot of different places to put a transmitter. Uh, and you got to think about that fact. Sure. That's, that's great. I, I, that's, to me, that falls under the category of one of those kind of counterintuitive ones, right? Where you just think, well, what difference does it make, you know, whether I put it on the belt or I put it in their pants, you know, I mean, you know. Yeah, another big problem that you alluded to is multiple units on a, on a, on a person on a single belt or on a strap. And, you know, you sort of you're, you pose the question, you know, how do you deal with that? It's like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, if you but, can. But I mean, at the same, by the same token, they've got to have it, you know, I mean, they've yeah. got to be able to do that. So, you know, is there, you know, can you kind of come up with a best practice or a suggestion there? I mean, do you, do you only turn on the transmitter that you're using at the given time? Or, you know, do you let the road crew guy say, okay, well, it's mandolin time. Uh, here's the transmitter for that, you know, whatever, you know, so. Uh, it becomes somewhat impractical uh, yeah, to do that. Yeah. Uh, but I think if you can work with the performer, let, let's take a guitarist, for example, that might have uh, a singing guitarist, you know, they got a head worn mic. And they've also got an inner system and then they've got their guitar mic. You know, if you're not paying attention, that guitar transmitter um, might be on a strap that's right there laying right over that inner receiver. Right. And really going to have problems. So instead, move that transmitter pack up to their shoulder position. So it's got free to radiate and it's not next to the others. And then if possible, put the, the inner pack and their head worn mic pack on opposite sides of their body or at least as far away as you can get away with it. Yeah. Every inch helps. I mean, this is inverse square law. You know, by separating them, not only are the strong signals uh, going to stay out of the uh, in ear receiver, uh, but you're going to reduce intermods if it's two transmitters by keeping them physically separate. So, you know, doubling the distance, that might mean going from two inches to four inches. You know, you're cutting how much energy gets from one to the other by, you know, a quarter. So, yeah. well, back to really signal to noise, matter. right? I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, really, it is exactly the same problem as you mentioned putting transmitter and receiver antennas on the same stand, well, you're putting yes, them on the is. same body. <laughs> you know, right. It's going to be the same problem there, right? So. Yep. Awesome. Uh, Jason, you want to j jump in there on that? Yeah. Uh, Carl, you nailed it. If I was going to add, uh, I would say uh, back to our frequency coordination talks where we were talking about band planning, uh, you can go the next step and uh, ensure that the in-ear monitor that is on talent A is in an entirely different band than the mic transmitter that's on talent A, uh, therefore giving yourself a ton of separation in your RF environment, uh, which will greatly reduce uh, the ability for those to even um, cause issues depending on how far away they are. And then secondly, uh, just a, a trick I learned when I was in the field is a, a lot of the body packs 
that exist allow you to flip the clip on the back of the transmitter, and therefore you get one antenna up and one antenna down, uh, and the clip still functions. Um, and that's kind of a neat little trick to give you a, just a little bit more separation when you're placing those packs. Right, right. Well done. Well said there, young man. Okay, uh, I'll let Volker get in there, and then we'll go to Joe, and then we'll jump on the big juicy topic of the day and go way over time. So there we go. Thank you. And Carl and Jason, great stuff which you showed. Here is the practical result, specifically when you are a fat guy like me. When you touch, when I touch the antenna to my skin, this is what is happening. So I'm losing 10, 15 dB of effective radiated power. So my carrier to noise ratio is simply going down. So I'm losing coverage. So what you might consider to do, and I know that's not anymore uh, possible in the US because McDonald's does not sell anymore those plastic straws but <laughs> if you get a vinyl t uh, tube which fits over the antenna which separates the antenna from touching the body this helps a lot so just literally That's, build an insulator yeah for the antenna. basically separate it a little bit from the body every inch as carl mentioned helps inverse square law so every inch of separation helps would so it, I this mean, tube is a lifesaver. Given that you're kind of putting a dialectic in place there, I mean, would you be would you would it be right to even think about heat shrinking an antenna that's going to touch somebody's yeah, body? You don't want to do that. Yeah, it's I, it's it's purely shooting from the so, hip. So yeah, not so practical, I yeah. would say, because for some applications you want to remove it. Yeah, got it. And you know, if it's fixed on, so I don't have such story to tell anymore. So that's <laughs> it. Sorry. <laughs> so in in reality this is something which you might consider go to an aquarium store where you find this tube on a spool yeah and yeah. then put it over so it it helps significantly specifically when the shape of the tube is like this yeah. it's bending away from the body but i think jason it, would concur that we don't want to use rope light for that okay i got it yes <laughs> Yeah, you don't right. want to tape it, it with gaffer either, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Joe Chaudelli, anything to add there? Well, I'd suggest that you try to convince the artist not to hold his handheld transmitter by its antenna. Uh, Good point. Good tip. Hot tip right there. I, yeah. I see it all the time. And also, if um, if you have a an actor or, or a uh, performer who's wearing body pack transmitters together with in-ear monitor receivers, keep those separated because once again, you could get that, that blocking phenomenon that Volker was, was demonstrating with the flashlight. Right. You know, right. The, the transmitter, you know, the, the body pack transmitter transmitting in and being picked up by the in-ear monitor receiver. Right, right you are. Yeah, that seems like tip of the day right there. Getting those two things separated give you a really good chance for success here. All right. All right. Uh, well, we're coming up on an hour and a half here, so we're going to, but I do want to spend some time on this subject because I think it's one of the more important ones that we're going to cover here today. So we'll just have to leave it to the edit team to get this all edited together when we get to finished here. But let's, let's talk about RF gain structure here now. And, um, you know, obviously this is one of the more important things that we talked about here. And just like normal gain structure in an audio circuit, you know, as Volker kind of alluded to earlier, more is not necessarily better. It's the, about getting the right amount of gain uh, to get your system optimized for signal transport, right? So that's, that's what we're talking about. We're just talking about it in a wireless sense here. So um, I'm going to let Volker start with this one, uh, if that's all right. And... You know, Volker, what I want you to talk about here is just, you know, what kind of impact the antenna type that we choose has on gain structure. What What is an optimized gain structure? Carl kind of alluded to, you know, operating at minus six is kind of an op, you know, kind of a good place to be. Give us give us some boundaries and, and let's honestly, let's, let's talk about it as if all of us in this room know nothing about RF gain structure. Take us take yeah, us from I, the beginning a little bit here. 
I think Carl said up to minus six. Uh, is up to okay. minus six. <laughs> Peace. Yeah. Let's be, be a little bit more precise. Yeah. In an ideal world, we would like to see around zero dB gain in the entire receiving. Talking about receiving systems, right? So that means basically you have your antenna. The antenna might have some gain. Anything between two to six, seven, eight uh, dB of gain, passive gain. And then you have the loss over the cable run, um, depending on the quality of your cable. If you are taking an RG58, that's a crappy cable. It's good for a jumper cable. This length is the maximum which you want to allow, right? So for an RG50, I know. RG58 is, is a good cable for a lot of application, but in general, it's a jumper cable. So as soon as you are starting to talk about gain structure, you want to have zero dB of gain uh, in the system. So this is where we usually go um, and try to accomplish. What you very often see is you are using a not so good antenna cable uh, and instead of compensating this with the better lower loss RF cable, a lot of applications put in an RF amplifier. So it, this setup is something which we simply want to avoid for a variety of reasons. First reason is uh, it's an electronic component. It might fail. It is additional connectors might fail. And you might create some intermodulation or some, some overloading of the amplifier. So you might put too much gain into your entire system. So for that reason, during my stay in the US uh, and during my time when I'm traveling, specifically for touring production in Asia, in Americas, in Europe, I never ever have an antenna, antenna amplifier with me because I know I will find in the production one anyway. <laughs> so what I usually have with me <laughs> is an RF attenuator. If I cannot get to the antenna booster, hey, I put at least an attenuator in the system that I get rid of the high gain and the high noise floor. At a certain point in time, this is what I demonstrated with the flashlight, when you are getting close with a too loud signal, you are overloading your front, front end. And then the entire system does not see anything anymore. So for how, that reason- How do you go about like seeing this and measuring it, Volker? Like how, how do you, when you walk in and what gives you the, the clue that you're overloading a front end somewhere? Depends on the system. Uh, which I'm using. But I mean, I, I guess um, what I'm getting at, is there metering? Are you using a device to measure? You, 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 Some systems usually, have a uh, overload light. Sorry, Kyle, go ahead, please. I was just going to say, some receivers have an RF overload light. I believe the Shures uh, do mm -hmm. have it. It's a handy tool. Yeah. yeah. In, in, Jason, please. Sorry. Okay. No, so, I was just confirming. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I'm less familiar with all the rest of the systems here, but sh you know, the sure some of the shures have an overload light and some warning messages. Um, if if you've got overload taking place, I'm sure there's there's ways to to see that happening on multiple uh, manufacturers. I was just confirming. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. guess my question kind of resolves about how do you do this precisely, right? I mean, if I mean, obviously in audio we have a meter, you know, in one dB steps or, or higher resolution. You have a meter in, in RF as well. Yeah. So I'm I'm getting concerned when I see that the RF noise floor is significantly higher than in normal setups. Because I know that my receiver, that every receiver has only a certain amount of dynamic range. So if I have the noise floor way up, I know that the signal which is above is only a certain amount which I can can get into the system to demodulate this. Yeah. So yeah. for that reason, um, it is critical to have a look at the noise flow without any transmitters at the beginning. 
All right, so that's that's a clue for you. If you have no transmitters on, just looking at the noise floor in terms of its actual yeah. amplitude yeah. at the receiver and making an assessment of, boy, I bet we have too much gain in this system to begin with, right? Is that is that correct? Correct. A scan can help if you can display this on, on uh, a software like Workbench, card software, our software, and you see that the noise floor is higher than normal, be skeptical. Something is wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who wants to jump in there next? Carl, you, you kind of came in there. Uh, let's just go to you next and you can sure. discuss this as well. Um, I've got one slide and, and I would answer, you know, that's a great uh, recommendation that Volker makes about looking for your high RF noise floor. That's always a clue when people describe to me, you know, I'm, I'm having to set my coordination threshold at 20 microvolts or whatever. It's like, well, that's way too high. Um, let's get some attenuation on that system and maybe some filtering. Uh, but let me show these slides real quick. Part of this is, uh, it's relatively simple math, thankfully. I mean, intermodulation calculation is a little more complex. This is a little simpler, uh, but it's just adding and subtracting. Like I mentioned before, your, your paddle antennas and directional antennas will have some amount of passive gain. It's a good idea to read the spec sheet and see what that is. And then you might have RF amplifiers. Your cable has very specific amounts of loss at specific frequencies, and there's plenty of tables out there on the internet that show this uh, for a variety of cables. Uh, and then you might look at uh, losses in, in other parts of the system, like a passive split, uh, which Volker had on his slide. So here's an example system where uh, the antennas have 4 dB of passive, which is typical for paddles, uh, 6 dB of active gain, and then we've got the dreaded RG58 cable 100 feet, which is <laughs> too long for this stuff with minus 12 dB of loss. And that's why the uh, 6 dB of uh, gain is added. Then we come into an active antenna distro or split, which is a unity gain. And then we've got some short jumpers in the rack. So this results of uh, results with the receivers seeing about minus 3 dB compared to what went into the amplifier, uh, into the antennas in the first place. Uh, so this is perfectly fine. I would say, you know, this is a well-tuned system and relatively easy to, to do. I recommend that people make like a, uh, you know, a flowchart or a block diagram and just do the pluses and minuses. Now, if I go to, uh, here's another system where we subbed out the cables for very low loss cable. Now it's 25 feet of 9913. That's the thick uh, stuff that's very low loss. And now suddenly we've got plus 4 dB hitting our receivers with the same settings on our uh, antenna amplifiers. So the thing to do here now is is bring in uh, 4 dB of attenuation to bring it just under that 0 dB. And I agree that the goal is, and I've long said this in many seminars and ones I've worked with with Joe and so on, 0 dB throughput from your antennas to your receivers is the goal. But I'm finding a little bit of attenuation to be helpful these days with such a, a noisy RF environment with all the TV stations packed together and so much wireless gar garbage on every stage that a little bit of attenuation tends to help to bring down that overall amount of energy getting into your receivers. So uh, in this case, I knocked it down by four. I could have done minus two and it would have been zero dB throughput. Uh, but like I say, I've been more and more fond of a little bit of attenuation. Hope that makes sense. It does. Absolutely does. Yeah. Jason, uh, what do you got for us? Yeah, I think uh, you guys you guys have knocked it out of the park. Uh, it's we all have diagrams or slides that are so similar. It's it's <laughs> awesome. I love it. I was gonna pull mine. That's up, a good thing. That's a good same, thing. It's the same Horrible. thing, right? Um, yeah, it's important to know that when you turn gain up or down on an RF system, uh, it's not the one frequency that you're paying attention to that is being affected. It's everything that antenna sees and a little bit outside of it, right? So. The, the less is more syndrome, the passive is massive, right? Like if you turn, if you, oh, my 470 is 600, I need more gain. You go plus 12 on that, that antenna. You just raised everything, including your noise floor, um, exponentially larger than, than what you are anticipating, uh, most likely. So um, that is not, the <laughs> yeah, that's not always the right move. In fact, it very rarely is the right move is to add gain to your antenna system. You're looking to balance it. Um, and, you know, Robert, you asked earlier, what's the specific tool? And this, we talked about these earlier, the really expensive um, spectrum analyzers. And this is kind of where 
where you can really define your system and you get a tracking generator, which is the, a tool and a spectrum analyzer that will output RF at a specific value, uh, neg 60, you plug one side of your cable into that and the other side in, you go, okay, what's the difference at my neg 60? Okay, it's 3 dB. This cable has 3 dB of loss, right? This is this is how you get to really tuning your antenna system. Um, that tool is expensive, but it's how you test all your RF components in your system. So you can test your DA ports this way, you can test your antennas, you can test your cable. It does all the things in your system that have an input output throughput uh, with a you know a specific value. Um, and that's where buying a spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator is the bang for the buck um, and why it costs so much. And that's yeah. how you really get to get these exact numbers, right? You can well, know, Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, finish up your thought. Yeah, there. you can sorry. know your antenna types and their standard gains, right? This LPDA is 6 dB, and this cable's rated at X dB of loss over this mount, this many feet. Uh, and you can know your distribution amplifiers or, or your combiners, if you will, and what how those affect things. But uh, the truth of the matter, those are just best guess assumptions. Um, and while that is most likely good for most applications, if you really want to be precise, that that track and generator and spectrum analyzer is how you how you get that yeah. measurement down to a T. Well, let's, uh, where I was going to jump in there, Jason, is say let's, yeah. let's kind of go to the opposite end of the spectrum, no pun intended here, uh, with, you know, people that, uh, let, I mean, the, the place where I want to jump into is let's, let's jump into the church on Sunday morning, right? Where, okay. you know, we don't have this kind of analysis equipment. We don't have these kind of things. But yet something's a, a miss. Maybe somebody's come from here and said, oh, I need to get my antennas out of the back of my rack, et cetera. What are the other, in you guys' systems, what are the other kind of checkpoints to say, okay, well, here's where the RF gain is sitting on my transmitter, here's where it's sitting on my receiver. Where, how do I kind of balance these things and look at it and go, okay, this is where I need to make an adjustment right now? Can I be that broad and abstract and ask that there? Absolutely, that's a, that's a really realistic question, right? Uh, it, it is real, because it's doesn't. it happens yeah. every week, right? Um, I mean, okay, I've got a little receiver that's got an RF gain knob on the back. What, what do I do? Yeah. Right. Utilize the tools that you're given, right? So uh, most of the softwares I know from all the manufacturers here are free and have an absurd amount of tools built into <laughs> them. So if you have their gear, get the software, do some homework, understand that. That will get you a scan and do your intermod calculation, right? And then look at the meters that the receiver is telling you and become familiar with what's normal and what's abnormal based on those meters. Um, there, it, I would be lying if I told you I've never tuned an antenna system based on the front RSSI meters of a receiver, right? Like I, I didn't have the tools I needed. You can use those RSSI meters. They're pretty accurate. They're there for a reason. You can, you can deduce a lot of information from those. Right. Um, and then, you know, the next level to that, if I was going to go one step further, is um, in digital systems, we have a new meter. Uh, most manufacturers have a new meter. I, uh, it's called a Q or a quality or a link, or there's a ton of terminology for them. Um, and that meter is the uh, algorithm based on signal to noise and quality of those ones and zeros that you're receiving, essentially, right? It's a, a way to measure the quality of that packet uh, that is now being transmitted. Um, and you can do some really cool things with that meter against your RSSI meters where if your RSSI is low, uh, you, uh, you receive signal strength indicator, the RF meter, um, and your Q link, whatever your terminology is, meter is high, uh, it usually means that you're close to end of range, but your noise floor is good and you've got a great signal, right? You can use those two meters in conjunction to, to deduce some information of your system. So if you're talking digital, there's one extra little meter that you can use to, to get some information out of, out right. of what you're using. Yeah. Right. Great stuff, man. Great stuff. All right. Uh, who else we got here? So, I, I, sorry, I've lost track of it. I'm a horrible host here. <laughs> who, who's left to discuss this? <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in there? Uh, if I if I may. Um, of course, Joe. Go ahead, man. Please. Sure. I, I got a, a few slides that I, I, I think uh, might be worth seeing. Uh, basically, uh, Volker was talking about loss from uh, cable loss. And Carl rightfully said, hey, if you can solve things possibly, it's it can always be a big advantage uh, with wireless mics. So um, 
Cables used in professional wireless microphones are, are 50 ohm cables. Uh, and um, not all 50 ohm cables are, are equal. Volker mentioned RG58, which is kind of like a standard cable. Uh, um, RG59, which is the stuff that your cable company uses for video, that's 75 ohms. RG58 is the 50 ohm equivalent to that cable. And it's a rather thin cable, but it's got high loss. So if we're looking at like 600 um, megahertz, operating at 600 megahertz, like we do for many wireless microphones, the loss of 100 feet of RG58, it's almost, it's about 16 dB. If you use a lower loss cable, like uh, what uh, I think Carl alluded to, RG213, you've already reduced that loss by about 10 dB just by using a higher quality cable. Yeah. So that's the first thing you want to do if you're running long antenna cables. Now, in any wireless system, there's the distance between the, the microphone transmitter and the receiver antenna. That's, that's air, okay? You're going to lose a lot of signal just through the air. But once you capture it by your receiver antenna, so then you're going to go down your RF cable to your receivers, but then your receivers are connected to your mixing console with with, um, uh, with audio cables. Now, signals attenuate due to cable length, but it's all, they're also frequency dependent. And since all frequencies are much higher than audio frequencies, if you have to choose between running long RF cables or long audio cables, run long audio cables because they're, they're lower frequencies, so there'll be less attenuation through the length of the cable. Great tip right there. Yeah, I'll take that one with you. So now here's kind of a chart of some uh, uh, popular 50 ohm coax cables. And I can tell you in terms of low loss cables, the popular ones are like this LMR 600. It's, it's uh, if we're looking at uh, 600 megahertz, you can see here that 600 megahertz, it's only a couple of dB of loss uh, over 100 feet. Now, it's not as good as LMR 900, but as, as Volker alluded, you know, the LMR 900 is a much thicker, heavier cable, harder to wrap up night after night or whatever. Uh, so LMR 600 or even 400 are, are we're, more we're much too lazy to use LMR 900. We're much too lazy. <laughs> and then we we all know of, this. In terms of Belden cable, 9913 is an excellent cable. RG213 is an excellent cable. I would just, uh, on the bottom, you can see RG58. Avoid RG58 except for very short cable runs. Going back to the... Uh, the fact that video cables are 75 ohm, you may find a lot of video spare video cables lying around. And, you know, one person once, you know, debated with me that, well, you're better off using a low loss 75 ohm cable than, let's say, a standard RG58 higher loss 50 ohm cable. And there is some validity to that argument. However, remember that every impedance mismatch when you connect to something, you lose one to one and a half dB. So if you're going from antenna to receiver, that's, or, or antenna to, to, to splitter, you know, there's an a impedance mismatch, and then from splitter to receiver, that's a receiver mismatch. So, but, hey, look, in a pinch, you can use 75 ohm cable, but you're better off using a high quality 50 ohm cable. Copy that. So this goes back to what we were saying about uh, uh, adding up your losses. Carl was talking about, you know, adding up your losses. And, you know, in a theoretical ideal world, you want to, you want to have enough booster to make up for antenna cable loss and any splitter loss that you're going to have. 
Uh, remember, you have external splitters, but a lot of receivers come um, with dual receivers, so there may be an, there's an internal splitter in there. So, but here, in this scenario, you want to put the amplifier as close to the re receiving antenna as possible. And that goes to your carrier to noise ratio. So, also, active antennas often have a, um, a filter built into them so that this antenna itself is picking up basically all the UHF frequencies generally below one gigahertz. But, you know, if you have all your mics within a certain frequency range, you can filter out just that frequency range. And this way, if you have strong um, unwanted signals outside the filter, you're not amplifying those strong um, potentially interfering signals. Nice. So it's always a good idea to have a filter before any booster that you're, you're providing. Now, a lot of people um, uh, think that antenna boosters will give you a lot more uh, transmitter operating range. It's not true. Uh, antenna boosters should just compensate for split uh, for cable loss and and possibly any splitter loss, because as Jason was mentioning, when you boost, when you use a booster, you're not only boosting the sig your wanted signal, you're boosting all the noise together with it, and your goal for an antenna booster is just to preserve carrier to noise ratio as it goes down a long antenna cable so that by the time your receivers see it you basically have the same carrier to noise that is seen at your receiver antenna this next slide shows it a little bit uh, a little more in detail if you have this top graph has as as an antenna with no booster so as your uh, signal is going down this long cable, your, your signal is getting lower and lower and lower and lower in amplitude until at the end it could get actually hidden within the noise floor. And then where are you? Nowhere. So what you want to do in this scenario, if you have a long antenna cable, is you add the booster. But as you can see here, this is this is the signal seen right at the antenna, and then we add the booster. That, that's this next one. You can see that the noise has been boosted as well. But as, as both the signal and that amplified noise go down the cable, they're both being reduced. But now, if you have proper gain at that booster, by the time you get to the receiver input, you now have the same carrier to noise ratio as was captured at, at the receiver antenna. Yeah, that's good, that's good. So going to, okay. Uh, Joe, if you can uh, wrap up here in about a minute and a half, two minutes, that would be awesome. I shall. So this is, this is the last point I'll, I'll make. Okay. So here's a, kind of a block diagram of what we have often done in Broadway, where you have an antenna, you have long antenna cable runs, so we have a booster. But, but uh, this antenna captures all your wireless microphone um, transmitters. But uh, then we go into this special filtered booster where we filter out four different ranges that correspond to groups of our mics, okay? So maybe range one is 480 to 488 megahertz, uh, uh, and then range two is 512 to 518, and range three is different than range four. So we're filtering out these different ranges at the antenna boosters. Then we're boosting 
each range independently, okay? Then we combine again, we go down the antenna cable. So now we've preserved our carrier to noise until we've gotten to these, our antenna splitter. This antenna splitter is one box that's gonna feed, let's say 24 different receivers, okay? So we're going to then filter out these different ranges again. And now we're gonna amplify after the filter uh, so that we're gonna feed our different groups of wireless microphone receivers. Now, this seems like a lot of extra work having all these extra filters and extra amplifiers that are independent in these four different groups. But what's the advantage is once you filter out a specific frequency range, then you can frequency coordinate just within that range and ignore signals outside the filter. And, and uh, just to so, so you can see the practicality of this. So if you have to calculate third order intermodulation products, if you're dealing with eight channels, let's say there was eight, eight microphones in each one of those four groups. Well, each group you have to calculate 225 intermodulation products, okay? But you do that four times. That's still way less than if you had a 32 channel system that you all had to coordinate 32 channels because the intermodulation products are almost 16,000 intermodulation products. Thank you. It's all down to math. They don't call it the lab for nothing here. I mean, it's, it's, it's the right name. I just have one comment. That sounds expensive. <laughs> uh, do you expect something different from us? <laughs> you know, that expensive money, German made stuff, man. It, it's there's nothing like it. Money is no object. I mean, when you have no money, it's no object. So it's that's how it works. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, uh, we're coming up on two hours here, so I, I'm definitely going to keep this inside of two hours. Um, I, I've noticed a lot of activity in the chat here, which is really excellent. I've seen a lot of great questions come and get answered there. Uh, but I did promise I want to I want to open up the floor for some live questions here before we close down. So uh, if anybody's got a live question for any of these four absolutely excellent experts that I've invited in today. And by the way, thank you guys. I mean, really, really exceptional stuff here. Very much appreciate you guys being here. Uh, by all means, uh, chime in and ask them a question. You know, we may not see them at a trade show for a long time here. So now's the time to ask a question if you got it. I got their phone number, so I, you know, I don't have to ask the question here. <clears throat> Anybody want to chime in with a question here outside of the chat? Uh, I do. May I please? Yes, please. Go ahead, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, I live in Las Vegas now, and uh, I do quite a bit of RF at Mandela Bay. Well, I used to last two years ago, <laughs> and uh, I'm looking forward to come back. But now my question is, how concerned should I be with RF? leading from the stadium, which is across from Mandela Bay. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Uh, you know, as soon as you said Las Vegas, I was wondering if this was going to be part of your question. I swear to you. I remember um, they, I was thinking, okay, this is going to have to do with the stadium. <laughs> because uh, I, I used to RF uh, coordinating there quite a bit. But now I'm very, very scared. Yeah. But, you know, and uh, Bruce, I, I'll just interject there. I, you know, this may actually drive us to a bigger topic here. This this topic kind of came up in the back lounge the other day, funny enough, when we were talking about this lab, is how much RF protection is built into buildings uh, that we work in now, especially in places like Vegas where you're in performing arts centers, et cetera. And, you know, can you actually make it part of the construction to get some RF isolation from the other buildings on the Strip? Think about the amount of, I mean, our, Las Vegas is kind of like Manhattan to some degree. Think about the amount of RF that is going on day to day in that location. So, uh, who wants to jump in and, uh, and address Bruce's concern here? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop in here. I uh, Bruce, I spent most of my life in Las Vegas. That's where I grew up. I live in Nashville. Then now. you're the man to answer this question. Bring that's it on. Did, that's where I did a majority of my RF. Actually, was in that town. Um, uh, you're the stadium's going to be an interesting 
debate. You are right across the street there. Um, obviously, Sundays are going to be your biggest worry. Uh, but to be honest with you, um, you know, a majority of that bowl is is below ground uh, inside where the field level is actually. Um, and so most of your transmission is going to have a, a decent amount of attenuation because of how the construction of that building is built. Um, and then we go back to when we talked about earlier, like you asked me if a chain link fence is RF friendly or not, right? <laughs> so your steel beams um, and, uh, you know, all, all of that metal is, is quite, a, quite a large attenuator. And then when you talk about the, the power of which we operate uh, legally at, going outside that building from a recessed field uh, across the freeway and then through Mandalay Bay and into your ballroom is probably not uh, hyper likely, assuming that people are playing by the rules. Uh, but your best bet is going to be to put an antenna outside um, and run a scan uh, on Sunday uh, during game time and then put an antenna inside whatever your venue is at Mandalay Bay and do another scan. And then you can compare those two and say, hey, uh, this is this is what it looks like outside. This is what it looks like inside. And this is what's happening on game day. And this goes back to you know, how many scans do you take and where? I would always take an indoor and an outdoor scan of the venue I was at because um, – it, you know, you pop open a pair of uh, a double wide doors at six different entryways and you didn't take an outside scan and suddenly they're going to leave those doors open for the, you know, the first half of your performance or the, the opening act or whatever. And that can significantly change what RF gets in, in and out of your building. So, uh, you know, that, that me, falls under one of those headings that we have to deal with sometimes as audio guys, right? Where you have to go yeah. to the management and say, you want the RF to mics to work? We need to right. shut the doors. Wait a minute, you're telling me if I shut the doors, the RF mics are going to work. Yes, that's what I'm right. telling you. Thank but, you. You know, I mean, you're bringing up a great point there. And maybe it's the, maybe we all should be doing this, right? Is coming up with indoor versus outdoor scans to see what kind of RF rejection our building has, right? Yeah, it is happening Definitely. a lot. Uh, yeah. Um, and you, 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 one person asked, what can I do to treat? Uh, some of the old TV studios have chicken wire all over the <laughs> yeah. holding, holding up the sound softness. And like, that's, yeah. that's a pretty offensive uh, piece of install there, to be honest with you. It's like a Faraday cage for RF. So <laughs> good or bad, depending on how you use it. <laughs> depending on which way you're transmitting, right? Exactly. Yep. <laughs> in mind, if you do that, and, and Jason, absolutely correct. So I signed this off. Keep in mind that you are building a Faraday cage. Nothing is getting in, but <laughs> you have more reflection, so uh, which you have to deal with, right? right, so right. There's also paint which you can use for the walk. All done. So, but there is no free lunch. There's a little bit of a side effect yeah. on that. Well, as we always say here in the lab, audio is just managing your compromises, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. so no different in RF. All right. All right, uh, folks, we're, this is going to bring us right to the end of the hour here. I, 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 honestly, the most sincere thanks goes out to you guys. Uh, Joe, Carl, Volker, Jason, great to meet you. I, I got your phone number now. You know, I, it was a pleasure. I know how to get a hold of you now, my man. So thank you guys very, very much for coming in and doing this for me and bailing me out because this is not my level of expertise here by any stretch of the imagination. I would love to have you back again. Maybe we'll... Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry for taking you half hour over your time, Volker. By all means, you know, imbibe there. Uh, but maybe at some point we can come back with some practical examples, maybe even some lab experiments with RF. I think that would be kind of fun at some point down the road once I get kind of rebuilt and re-going here, okay? Great. So, guys, uh, thank you very much for showing up. Uh, I will knock it on the head here. We will see you again. Watch for emails on when the next lab is going to be, as I mentioned at the top. We're going to go dark for a few weeks to rebuild the lab here and, and hopefully set us up to do some more cool stuff. Uh, so that is that. We will see you guys on the old interwebs, if not at a load-in near you. Okay? So we'll see you. Thanks, thanks a ton for tuning in. We'll see you guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, thanks, Robert. Robert. Thanks, Pam. Thank